Hey guys, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi. Today what we're doing on the channel, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant in its Egyptian context. I've got the author of this book that I just read, or the, the title of it, The Ark of the Covenant in its Egyptian context. I've got Dr. David Falk with me on the channel. We're going to talk about some of the secrets behind the Ark of the Covenant. And it's actually really important, the Egyptian context to, to reveal some of those secrets. So, but before we get to that, I want to let you know about a couple things. So, uh, as you may or may not know, we actually have some free resources for you in every description of every video. The first is the rationality of Christian theism. It's a co-edited book with Dustin Crummett featuring different arguments for the existence of God. We talk about epistemology as well, a 60 page ebook, completely free. Download that in the description. There's a link to it. Uh, and then also if you're just coming to the conversation in apologetics or in theology or philosophy, and you're unfamiliar with the, some of the terms that get thrown around, some of the terms that get used, then uh, we've also got a list of different apologetics terms for beginners where we define all of these terms, provide uh, hyperlinks to uh, philosophy articles and everything to help you understand like what these terms actually mean. And so both of these two free resources are available in the description of this video. And with that, let's just jump right in. In. Actually, oh, let, let me do one more thing. So uh, we are doing actually a, a fundraiser tomorrow, and this right here is going to be one of the things that's featured. Let's see if we can get the camera to focus on it so you can kind of see what's going on here. These are custom cups. We're actually going to be doing a giveaway for new patrons and existing patrons. So um, if you're actually, if you are thinking about signing up to support Capturing Christianity and you were going to do that today, I recommend that you actually hold off until tomorrow because we're going to be launching a whole giveaway and stuff. And it's not just mugs. We're also doing some other stuff as well. So uh, for, again, for new and existing patrons. So uh, yeah, that's one of the things we're giving away. I'm super excited about this mug. This is like a custom thing. I, I, I'm going to talk more about it in a, a video for tomorrow. But with that, let's go ahead and invite our guest, Dr. David Falk. This is not his first time on the show. He was actually joining us was it over a year ago at this point where you came on to discuss the evidence for Exodus? Yeah, it was over a year ago. It was uh, quite a bit over a year ago, so that, that year went quickly. It's been a while, <laughs> but I'm super happy to have you back on. And uh, the, the impetus for this show was actually a, a show that was recorded originally on the Sean McDowell program between yourself and um, I'm actually blanking on the, the name of the other guy that was there. But uh, in any case, that show was was taken down. But I, I, I thought it was time that we have you at least back on the show because I think people kind of want to hear more from you. And so um, I'm really pleased. I mean, and Michael Jones was actually the one who suggested talking about the Ark of the Covenant. I was like, we haven't actually we've never talked about that. This is a great opportunity to have a Dr. Falk on the channel and to actually cover a topic that we haven't discussed before. So let's do this. As we start to get into this topic, why don't you just introduce yourself uh, really quickly for those that don't know who you are. Take about 60 seconds and then we'll get into the material. Okay, well, my name is David Falk. I am a research associate at the Vancouver School of Theology. I have uh, four graduate degrees. I did my PhD at the University of Liverpool. Uh, uh, under uh, Kenneth Kitchen and Steve Collier. So I've got a lot of pedigree here to talk about the Ark of the Covenant. You also have a, uh, what is the name of that guitar behind you? I know it's a, is it a Gibson or is it a, a off-brand? It's an Epiphone. <laughs> okay, it's an Epiphone. Okay. Well, it's not off-brand. It, it, the Epiphone is still made by Gibson, right? So it's... It's still made by um, Gibson, yeah. Did you put custom pickups in it or anything? Or is, it, or is that just like the stock... I, I did a few modifications, but nothing major. The pickups are the same. Okay. Yeah. Some people soft. go, I've known some people just like go crazy. They'll, they'll buy like the cheapest guitar body they can find and then just like load it up with all of the, you know, all these different upgrades and stuff like the best pickups, whatever. So I, I don't oh, know. I will, what kind eventually, of guitar... I will. I will eventually do that. Well, you've got I it mean, on display. Uh, so I was like, what is it? What is this? What is what's going on here? So. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what's what's let's, going let's... on here is is I love that thing, and it's it's on it's it's in the back because I, I really like it. <laughs> how often do you play? So, I mean, we should be getting into the material, but how how often do you play? <laughs> I use it actually mostly for composition. Mm. I I don't actually. I'm not a performer. I don't play uh, publicly. So what I do, but I do do a lot of uh, music composition. So I'll I'll use it for that. Nice. All right. 
let's get into the material for today. So uh, the Ark of the Covenant is the topic. And uh, the, the book, uh, oh, I should also mention I've got this book linked in the description of the video if you guys want to go pick it up. Uh, it's actually not too, too like, thick of a book. I think you can kind of see the, the thickness here if we can get the camera to focus on it. Yeah. So um, not too thick of a book. But what I was, what sort of surprised me is that there are so many images in here. And it's not just that you've got images. It's that they were taken by you. It says photo by author on, like, uh, you, you, I think you should, you told me before the show is like 90, 90 something images that you 99, 99, yeah. 99. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's talk about that first, I suppose. So sure. how did that come about? Why did you take all of these pictures yourself? Like, why didn't you just use stock photos? Okay. Well, I wanted to not just make a good scholarly work. I also wanted to make a work that was enjoyable to read. Mm -hmm. and a pleasurable sensory experience. I wanted people to have this on their coffee table and just pick it up, thumb through it, and go, ooh, ah. So to do that, I wanted to make sure that all that this was richly illustrated with lots of photos, original photos, you know, mm -hmm. travel-grade kind of photos. So... Uh, I took my uh, advance and blew the whole thing on a trip to Egypt. I did a three-week photographic uh, tour of Egypt that nearly killed me. <laughs> Why did because you if you know kill any, you? well, if you know anything about, uh, say, travel photography, you have to get up at like five a.m. in the morning to catch mm -hmm. the best light. Take the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're up in the morning at five a.m. You do your your early morning photos at the monuments. And then you hit the museums. Then you might catch a nap at uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And then you're back out again at um, 7, 6, 7 p.m. to take your evening photos. And then you're spending the next three, four hours doing your uh, photo processing to make sure you've got empty cards for the next day. So you're getting to bed somewhere around 11, 12 o'clock. And you I mean, repeat you're talking this to a, every day. You're talking <laughs> to a photographer, so I, I know like intimately what you're talking about. It is a, mm -hmm. it, it can be a lot of work. I mean, just going to like, just Crazy traveling to, just traveling to Europe and wanting to take photos that you know that aren't just on your phone or whatever. You've, I mean, it, it just it, in the gear alone, you've got to carry with you. I mean, nowadays mm -hmm. we are getting into like a. Uh, mirrorless cameras are, are making things a lot nicer now that we don't have to to carry a hug around. Uh, Ch tr what, what I can't think of the term. Um, you don't have to carry with you these big DSLR cameras. You can use these mirrorless cameras now that, that kind of do the same thing, but are just way smaller and, and way less. So it's nicer nowadays, but um, it, it is nevertheless still like a, it's a bit, it's like a big undertaking that you did. Oh, it is a okay, big so, undertaking. Yeah. All right. Let's get into uh, the actual material. I mean, w talking about pictures is, is some of the material, but where should we begin in, in sort of revealing some of the secrets? I mean, because that's kind of the point of, of your book mm -hmm. is to better understand the Ark of the Covenant and what it's all about. We have to understand right. the context, the historical context mm -hmm. of that. And it's coming out of a historical context because, I mean, w what is there? Well, let's start there. Let's start there. What is, how would you define the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant is a reliquary, which is a box used to hold a relic. And now those relics are, in this particular case, the, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, the law, that was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. Those tablets are placed in this chest where God meets with his people above the Ark between the wings of the cherubim. Okay. So it's, it's essentially a kind of um, shrine where the presence of God is transported. The presence of God comes down from Mount Sinai and inhabits the space between the, the, the wings of the chairman on the mercy seat. And this is where God meets man. Hmm. One of the so things that's that the Ark of the Covenant made, in a nutshell. One of the things that this made me think about was like, the implications of the Ark of the Covenant on our theology. Like, what should we think about the presence of God coming down from Mount Sinai to rest in between the two angels' wings? Like, why should we think that God's presence 
so to speak, could be located in one specific temporal location and then move between like the mountain down to this relic or the, the reliquy. Is that how you say it? Why would we? Yeah. So why should we think or, or should that impact our view of God or is this, how, how do you think about that? Well, it's part of say progressive revelation. Okay. God didn't dump everything on mankind at once. Mm -hmm. You know, that would have been really overwhelming. You know, if God just, you know, makes himself completely known. I mean, God did, you know, uh, from, say, Mount Sinai, talk to the children of Israel directly with his voice. And they were terrified, absolutely terrified. This is why they, they instituted prophets. Because it was overwhelming. Theologians call this the trauma of holiness, where a direct encounter with God will just sort of, you know, make you recoil in fear. Because the presence of God is too holy for us. So now what God's doing here with the Ark of the Covenant is slowly revealing himself, slowly revealing his nature. We kind of, today, we, we think it's kind of strange that people would think that God is only in one place at one time. But this was the predominant belief in the late Bronze Age. Everybody thought this. Nobody thought that that God was everywhere back in the late Bronze Age. Every every culture that we know, that we have have recordings and writings from believed that a God could only be in one place at a one time. This is a belief called localism. So, for example, if you were worshiping Amun Re at Karnak, you know you believe that the actual presence of Amun Re was in his holy statue in the middle of his temple. He might have influence in other places, but that's because he sort of uh, pops over and, you know, does this sort of um, time-sharing thing with other idols. So he'll move from idol to idol to idol to, to make his presence known. But he's only in one place at, a, at one time. This was normal. This was the normal view of divinity in the late Bronze Age. So what God is doing with the Ark of the Covenant is he's making a concession. He is condescending to mankind's beliefs in the moment so that he can have relationship with mankind. All right, let me do uh, let me do this now. So um, kind of what I do nowadays when I am reading a book for some interview or, or some show that I plan to do on capturing Christianity, um, the first thing I do is I look at the table of contents and I see... Okay, where, where should I actually go first to start reading the thing that's going to most interest me? And I was looking through the chapters. I was like, I can go ahead and read them out here and maybe uh, get some interest in the book. Discovering the chapter one, discovering the Ark for the first time. Chapter two, getting comfy with ritual furniture. Three, boxes and chests and arcs, oh my. Shrines, no tent like home. Barks, is that how you say that? Bark? Barques? Barks, yep. Barks. Art with a message. Six, the Ark and other extraterrestrial vehicles. That one looks interesting. The overarching context. Good one. Um, and then and then comes the epilogue. Where is the Ark today? And I'm at like you already. So that. OK, so I, I skipped directly to that section. OK, and of that's like, <laughs> of course I did. And that's that's what everyone wants to know. That's watching this currently is like, where is the Ark today? That's the secret I'm most interested in. I had it pulled up and I can't hear. OK, here it is. Um, but what was funny is, and this is this is indicative of like the rest of the book and the sort of tone that you that you uh, that you convey, and it, it's good. So probably I'll, I'll just read what you what you say here. Probably the most common question that I get is, "Where is the ark today?" Or the similar questions, "Is the ark in Ethiopia?" And wasn't the ark found under the Temple Mount? The book that you hopefully just read shows that the ark is important because of what it is and meant to the people in the past. And I hope that what you've learned gives you confidence in the historical nature of the Ark's story. I, I just thought that was, you like called me out immediately. You're like, hopefully <laughs> you read the book and understood the point of it. But nevertheless, like, let's get that one out. Let's, let's talk about where is the Ark today? Cause I, I sh I'm sure that's where most people are, are, are wondering like that, the deepest secret of the Ark, where is it? It's in a lot of places. 
because it was probably melted down for its gold content. It's a really, really, the, the, this is one of those times when sort of the truth is a little more disappointing than the fiction. Mm. You know, we all want to believe the Indiana Jones, you know, that's in a warehouse somewhere in Ohio. <laughs> But what happened was when Nebuchadnezzar uh, conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, he took all the precious objects of the temple back to Babylon. The largest of these objects were melted down for their metal content. And basically, he used the metal to pay his soldiers because his soldiers were paid in uh, precious metals. Babylon, as a military apparatus, was always cash-strapped. So it needed more money, always to pay its soldiers. So it did this by essentially purloining the religious objects of other cultures and uh, destroying them. And the temple objects were no different. Now, interestingly enough, there's actually... The furnaces that they used for this purpose were these big, massive furnaces that you could actually stand up in. They had to be tall enough to accommodate a very, very tall, sacred bark or chest. So you actually had, could stand up in these. This is where we see the, the furnace come in for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's one of those furnaces. They didn't create a furnace just for them. They're repurposing... Mm -hmm. This, this furnace used for sacred, destroying sacred furniture like the Ark of the Covenant, but as a, a tool of execution. And this is where we find, say, the appearance of the cherubim. They come in at that point. Hmm. So, so the answer is basically that it's, I mean, even uh, the last line, I just lost the place again. But the last line that you said, I thought was so great in, in answering the question of, where is it today? Oh, yeah. Okay, so the last thing. Where is the ark today? A small piece of it may be on your finger. Yeah. Because gold was repurposed. It was it was the original recyclable material. You know, long before people were recycling glass bottles and jars and all that, they were recycling gold. Every 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 nation would come in, steal each other's gold, burn it down, melt it, uh redistribute it. And then repurpose it again. Mm -hmm. All right. The ark so might be running the circuitry in your computer. Crazy, <laughs> crazy to think about. Crazy yeah, to so, think, um, but yeah, crazy to think that that's a, a real possibility because it was repurposed, as you said. All right. Uh -huh. So, so now we now that we've answered the question that everyone wants to know, and they're like people are going to stop watching. Let's get into uh, some of the history <laughs> of the Ark of the Covenant in in, in the Egyptian context. And I'll, yeah. I'll let you kind of lead this because this is your area. So okay. reveal as many secrets as you would like about the history of the Ark. Okay. Well, the first secret about the Ark is it didn't come out of a vacuum. It came out of a 3,000-year tradition of religious furniture. Now, I like to explain it this way. Think of it that like we're making a movie. Okay? You know, you've got a set. You've got actors. You've got... Um, um, stage crews and credits and all that in, in the movie. And then you take a photograph. Okay? And let's say 50 years passes. Okay? You've got the, still got the photograph and you've got the movie. You know, everyone else may be dead, but you still got those two. Okay? That movie can tell you a whole lot about the photograph because the movie has more information. You can match the photograph of the scene from that movie and go, oh, this is where it takes place in the, in the movie. Where is it on the set? You know, where, where's the location? You know, it, the, the movie gives you a lot of information that the photograph doesn't. Now, we've got 3,000 years of religious furniture from Egypt. That's our movie. The Ark of the Covenant, as described in the Bible, is a snapshot. And we can compare that snapshot to the movie, and that gives us a whole lot of information about the Ark of the Covenant. 
it will tell us where it's uh, where it fits in sort of the the stream of religious furniture, what kind of furniture it is, um, how it dates. For example, you know the iconography used on the Ark of the Covenant is very very specific to a certain time and place in Egyptian history, because we can date iconography. Iconography is eminently datable. As datable as a, say, scarabs or uh, ceramic uh, pots. So we can even narrow down to when, according to the snapshot, when that, that sort of fits in that 3,000 year history. Very interesting. Because you can get very, very specific here. Like for we, we know from, say, the, uh, the iconography that's used on the Ark of the Covenant that it dates to. It couldn't date any earlier than Amenhotep III and no later than the end of Dynasty 20. So it's, it's really in that new Egyptian New Kingdom period. And that's consistent with what we know from, say, uh, the description of the Exodus, which also places it in that time period. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just happy to continue listening if you want to Keep going. Hey, well, just keep droning on. <laughs> just keep going. I mean, I'm just sitting here listening and learning, even though I've, uh, as I said, I wasn't able to read the whole book, but I was able to skim a large portion of it. And um, I mean, just by looking at the pictures, there's a whole lot of data that you can you can draw from this. So um, I was actually going to add that if you do have a like a picture in mind that you'd like me to show on the screen, I'll see if I can find it and uh, and show people because I, I I do want people to to pick up the book. Did you mm -hmm. mention this in the show or did you mention this before we went on that you hope that this is going to be a, like a coffee table type book that people can just pick up and thumb through and, and look through it just as they I don't get it all now. <laughs> yeah. It, okay. Well, uh, either way. But, but yeah, we, we, I wanted this to be a, a book that people enjoy that, mm -hmm. that they can pick up thumb through and just, even if they don't read the text, enjoy the pictures. You'll learn something just from viewing the pictures. Oh, one thing I did uh, did pick up on is is how you were saying that like uh, back in the day, maybe I, I guess because you you did mention furniture. Um, back in the day, furniture was like the status symbol. Nowadays, it's like cars. Oh yeah, right. And so like oh, the yeah, first it was person, a total like you, status symbol. So it, uh, now, if you like win a whole lot of money or come into a lot of money, one of the things you do is you buy land and then you buy. A car like a super nice car mm -hmm. but back oh, yeah. in the day if you came into a lot of money you just buy a whole bunch of furniture and like customize it and mm -hmm. do all sorts of things to it and everything mm -hmm. well uh we we see for example in uh in the northern kingdom of israel there's there's a judgment made against it because they are reclining on beds of ivory you know that was the that was the the big status symbol was a bed mm -hmm. you know it was a bed and furniture is no different. Uh, we, we, we hear, like, for example, in the papyrus of Ippower, where um, the whole social order is turned upside down. Uh, the nobility becomes um, paupers and slaves accumulate mass wealth. Well, one of the things that they that is that, that, they, that we're told that they acquire as wealth are chests. Chests of clothing. So this was a big status symbol. If you had to be wealthy to afford this stuff. And religious furniture was the best of the best. You know, it was covered in precious metals and stones. Mm -hmm. And it was inlaid with, with, with exotic woods. And had had uh, say uh, stones that were secured with bezels. You know, it was just uh, it, they were fabulously uh, um, ornate works of art. And we have tons of examples of this, right? Like real. Oh yeah, we have tons of examples that have been excavated. Yeah, yeah. of uh, of Egyptian uh, mostly furniture. fragments of say the more sacred chests because uh, of uh, because when they were destroyed, you know, they would they would you know leave parts of it behind. But we've got stuff such as like figureheads, um, uh, inlays, all sorts of little pieces of, of these chests. 
uh, especially sacred barks we got a lot of say figureheads from them we've got complete sacred uh, uh, complete chests we also have uh say funerary beer beers lots of funerary beers as well so we've got plenty of examples and what probably one of the most important of these discoveries was the discovery of uh king's tuts uh, tuts tomb which has many examples of many different kinds of sacred furniture we find everything in tuts tomb from small exotic shrines to um the say the, the ornate chest of anubis that was used to carry his canopic jars to his tomb we also have the uh coffin shrines that were that were placed around his coffin four of these many of them well they were all overlaid with gold but some were also had lapis and turquoise inserts so like for example when we talk about the ark of the covenant you know, it tells us the Ark of the Covenant was overlaid with gold inside and out. We find this on some chests in Egypt. Like, for example, that that, that shrine uh, for the uh, sarcophagus of King Tut is lined with gold inside and out. We also see, like, for example, the jewelry box of Hetep Harris, uh, the queen mother of uh, King Khufu, builder of the Great Pyramid. She's got this jewelry box that's lined with gold inside and out. So we see kind of these we see these construction patterns used in the hmm. uh, for the Ark of the Covenant repeated over and over and over again in Egyptian material culture. Yeah, that that's one of the questions too. I mean, it, well, the point of the book is to give you some context, some some bigger context for the Ark of the Covenant, and it, it uh -huh. it's because of the fact that the Israelites were in Egyptian captivity for so long that it, it had mm -hmm. to have rubbed off on them. The rituals that oh, yes. you saw from the Egypt, it had to have rubbed off on them. Even like the hierarchies and the, and the way that they structured their political, like all, like there's things that rub off or rubbed off all over the place. Mm -hmm. But uh, what you're suggesting is, is in the particular case of the Ark of the Covenant, there's a whole lot of oh, yeah. things that we can see from the Egyptian culture that is consistent with what's described in the Bible. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we also we don't we don't just find this in say though the Ark of the Covenant. We also find this in like the priestly rituals, uh, some of the kosher laws. Like for example, the pro one of, my, one of the most important of these is say the prohibition against eating pork. You know, prohibition against eating pork is not a Semitic custom. It's not a custom that you find in the Levant prior to the Israelites, but it's a, it's an Egyptian custom. It's an Egyptian custom. And it was one that was practiced at the city of Avaris before the Exodus. So they're bringing that custom with them back to Israel when they uh, do the conquest. So we find this, these like, for example, also like, for example, the priestly purification rituals, a lot of them are very, very similar to Egyptian priestly purification rituals. That whole ritual bathing, putting on clean clothes, not wearing animal garments when you go into the temple. A lot of that is very, very similar to Egyptian ritual practice. The 40 years of the wandering in the Sinai is a program of de-Egyptianization but it's also a winnowing. It's also a winnowing. The Israelites are coming out of out of Egyptian culture after being there for around 350 years. And as they come out of that culture, there's going to be some things that they they're, they're, they're bringing a whole lot of practices with them. They're bringing a whole lot of habits with them. They're bringing a whole lot of ethics with them. And that winnowing process God is going to use in the Sinai, he's going to say to the Israelites, okay, this is bad. Stop doing this. You know, you're, you're having extramarital relations with your neighbor's wife, committing adultery. Stop that. But he's going to also say some of the things that they did in Egypt were good. Continue it. Like, you, don't, you didn't eat pork in Egypt? Continue that. That's good. Don't do that. 
Okay, so so there's going to be there's going to God's going to give the thumbs up to some things and the thumb that thumbs down to others. So when you've got a culture like Israel coming out of Egypt that's that steeped in a pagan society, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time to take the Egypt out of the Israelites and replace it with a more pastoral culture. So let me ask you this, what is the, like, the best reason to be skeptical of the existence of an actual Ark of the Covenant with the actual tablets of Moses inside of them? Well, that's just it. There is, I don't think there is a really a good reason to be skeptical of it. Um, I, I, think, I think people are skeptical of it today because in, in many respects, the, the Sinai itself has changed a lot. You know, if you if you could could an exodus like that happen today? No, no, essentially not. I mean, if if we were if we had the the, the say a group of Israelites living in, in say Cairo, and they wanted to leave, and and reenact the exodus for forty years, they couldn't do it. They wouldn't be successful. But that's also too because the environment of the Sinai has changed rapidly over the last eight thousand years. 8,000 years ago, the Sinai was grassy fields and forests. The Sinai today is a hostile desert. The Sinai of Moses' time was a savanna. We have record, Egyptian records of, of um, Bedouin who were grazing cattle in the Middle Kingdom. Now, cattle require a lot of silage. They require a lot of water. Now, by the late Bronze Age, the Bedouin had to switch from cattle to goats and sheep because those consume less resources. So what we have with the Sinai is a period of desertification. We know, for example, that Sinai had a lot of acacia trees. They had a lot of acacia trees and large acacia trees. We know they have a lot of acacia trees because they were using... Uh, the locally resourced wood to smelt uh, smelt copper at Sarabit al Qaeda. No, they're not bringing the you know they're not bringing truckloads of of wood with them to Sarabit al Qaeda. They're they're chopping down the local forests to make make those uh, those uh, essentially smelting operations. You know they're they're taking copper ore and they're heating it until it becomes metallic copper. But this leaves huge heaps of slag in its place. So we do know that the environment of the Sinai was very, very different during the time of Moses than it is today. So I think that leads a lot of people to, to be very, very skeptical of the whole 40 years wandering in the wilderness, as well as the existence of the Ark of the Covenant. You know, even... Even uh, when we get to, say, for example, the time of, say, um, the first and second centuries AD, you know, during the period of the rabbinic scribes, the rabbis uh, who wrote the Talmud were having a, a, an issue with, well, you know, how could they make the ark and the, the tabernacle out of acacia wood? You know, at that, at that point in time, uh, acacia was a, a very, very small, inferior scrub species. Okay. All the big acacia trees were gone. So even then that they were having some, some, some problems, you know, reconciling the, uh, the, um, the exodus and the, and the wandering in the wilderness at the time of Moses with what was current for them. You know, today it's even worse. So, so that's probably the, what, what causes people the most problems is how do we, how do we, you know, reconcile this, you know, tens of thousands of people wandering through a desert. And the short answer is it wasn't a desert at the time of Moses. It was a, it was a savanna. It had grasslands, you know, they weren't really, I mean, it was, water was still a scarce resource, but 
there was still enough, say, grasslands that you could pasture sheep. So I think another option for skepticism would be, okay, well, we can grant that maybe there was like this Ark of the Covenant that held even, say, tablets of Moses that were inscribed on there. But um, that still leaves open the question, like, what were the actual like, properties of this thing? Did people die when they came close to it or touched it? Like, what were the actual, you know? <laughs> so maybe that's where the skepticism would, would go. Okay. Is toward the... There there are... You do get um, legends that did grow up around the Ark of the Covenant. Like you find there is a, a, a Tal, uh, Talmudic legend that said that the Ark of the Covenant could fly. It couldn't fly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It, it, it didn't have any of those properties. And it, and it didn't just strike people dead. Okay. It's, it's not a magic box. It has no inherent properties of its own. The properties it has... That that's falsely attributed to the ark is actually the presence of the Lord Himself. Now you look at the incidents in the Bible where somebody is punished for mishandling the ark. It's usually the, the result of, say, a double offense. They've done not just one thing ritually wrong, but more than one thing ritually wrong. It's kind of like it's kind of like when you go speeding. You know, you go speeding down a down a freeway. And you start getting followed by a cop. And you think, oh, no, I'm, I, you know you're speeding, okay? You know you're speeding. He hasn't turned on the lights yet. You know you're speeding. He knows you're you speeding. Slow down. You slow down and you change lanes. He's got gotcha. you. You've just done an illegal lane change. <laughs> he hasn't got you on one offense. He's got you on two. Then you get your ticket. <laughs> it's the same deal. God's not getting these people on one offense. He's getting them on multiple offenses. Like, for example, let's take, for example, the um, when uh, Uzzah gets struck dead. You know, David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to, uh, to Jerusalem. So he gets uh, Uzzah and Ahiho to collect the Ark. They put it on a donkey cart, and then the donkey cart rears up, Uzzah touches the ark, and he's struck dead. Now, that's actually a second offense. It's, okay, it's not a first offense. That's a second offense. One, you're not supposed to carry the ark of the... You're supposed to carry the ark of the covenant by, a, by its poles. Never put it on a donkey cart, or an ox cart in this case. Ox, ox carts are uh, richly unclean. They're richly unclean. So that's the first offense. The second offense is who was supposed to be carrying the ark. If you look at the genealogy uh, that, that's at the beginning of that chapter, it tells you that Uzzah was uh, the son of Abimadad. Who's Abimadad? King David's brother. Uzzah was David's nephew. He was a Judahite. Only Levites were permitted to carry the Ark of the Covenant. So you have two offenses there. One, Uzzah was unqualified to carry the Ark or to handle the Ark. Second of all, he put it on an ox cart. And then when he touches it, he, he receives the summary judgment. We also see this even with the sons of Aaron. This happens too when the sons of Aaron in uh, Numbers chapter four, uh, three, offer strange fire to to uh, God, you know, and they're 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 killed with a blast of fire. Well, you found out in say chapter four that they also removed the poles from the Ark of the Covenant, which is also an offense. So it isn't just the strange fire that's the problem here; it's how they've handled the Ark that's the problem. So it's not just one when, when when you're dealing with the Ark of the Covenant here, one doesn't get ever get struck down for one thing. It's usually a matter that that there's been, say, slack in how the rituals are being handled. Things are being done in an unlawful way, and it's just a matter of summary judgment. 
because we have to remember too that that you know Moses handled the ark. You know, he popped the lid open, put the tablets in, and then closed it. There's nothing inherent to the ark of the covenant that is um, that will you know strike you dead instantly. Now, in the case of say when the Philistines when um, Saul takes the Ark of the Covenant out to war and loses it, and it's captured by the Philistines. You know, the Philistines bring it back to the Temple of uh, Dagon. They pop the lid open, take a look around, and they get sores and, um, and tumors. Okay, some of them die, but most of them live through that. So they, they think this thing's a menace. They put it on a... a uh, on a milk cart that has never pulled a load, so it's it's actually ritually pure. Okay, so they show more respect than than David's uh, um, nephews did. But it arrives at Beit Shemesh, and you get the Israelites, and they pop open the lid. They have a look around, and they're struck dead. They're struck dead. The difference here between, say, the Israelites and the Philistines, who did the exact same thing, is that the Israelites should have known better. The Philistines didn't know better. They're Philistines. They don't have the law. But the Israelites at Beit Shemesh did. And they received judgment because they knew better, and they weren't respectful to the Ark of the Covenant, knowing what it was. Yeah, so someone in the comments is saying, well, how then, because your theory about where the Ark is today is that it was destroyed. How can someone destroy something like that that can just strike people down? Easily. Easily. Any, 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 fire, any, any holy object can be destroyed with fire. You know, we do this all the time with, say, for example, uh, and, and it's not necessarily holy, but we do respect, like, the flag. Okay? What, what's the proper procedure for, burning a, uh, for destroying a flag, an American flag? You do a flag destruction ceremony. You roll it up, and you set it on fire. You, you burn it. Burning is purification. Okay? This has always been true. You, you purify things through fire, through heat, through burning. So this is the proper way to destroy holy items, is to burn them. So it's, it's no problem for, for say, the, uh, um, the Babylonians to take something like the Ark of the Covenant, haul it back to, to Babylon, and, and melt it down for its content. Be no problem at all. In fact, you know, even the whole, the whole, the whole temple, when it's burned to the ground, it's burned to the ground. It's, it's it's a kind of sanctification. You know, this is this is this is this is a temple that has been defiled by idolatry through Israel's sin, through basically the Israelites saying the temple, the temple, the temple, and turning the temple into almost an idol itself. So to burn the whole thing to the to the ground is purification. This is why, for example, uh when the Ark of the Covenant is made, it's actually made not by casting, but cold forming. So they take the gold and they beat it into shape. But this requires richly pure gold to begin with. The gold that has not been used in an idol. The, uh, the, the text says that the gold was pure. Now, ancient, in the late Bronze Age, there was no such thing as 24 karat gold. They didn't have cementation, which was a process that was used to purify gold to near 24 karat. So the typical, your, your, your purest golds were usually around 70% 70, 70 tops. But what that's talking about there in, say, Exodus 25, is gold that is ritually pure. It's never been used in an idol. So when they do this cold forming, they're taking gold that has been purified either through fire or was never part of an idol. So once a say uh, an idol, you can take an idol of gold, and and it's it's a it's a it's an impure thing. It's a it's an unholy thing. You take that idol, 
you put it in a furnace, you melt it down. That gold is now purified by fire. It's completely pure as far for ritual purposes because it's been made clean by the fire. Doesn't matter anymore if it had been used in an idol or not. It's now ready to be used for holy or sacred purposes. All right. And uh, is there anything else before we move to some Q&A with the audience? Is there anything else from the book that you would like to uh, bring up? I mean, and I, I don't want to cover everything and we can't cover everything, mm -hmm. but I do want people to pick up the book. So again, it's linked in the description of the video, The Ark of the Covenant in its Egyptian context, uh, fully illustrated. It, it, it's actually the subtitle is An Illustrated Journey. And it is. It's a it's a beautiful mm -hmm. illustrated journey. And uh, yeah, so um, anything from the book that we should maybe mention before we move to Q&A? Yeah, uh, the mercy seat. Uh, one of the sort of the secrets of the of the Ark is we see this, the cherubim. And, you know, we uh, one of the things that biblical studies has tried to teach people for, for, say, the last century is that cherubim were like winged bulls or winged lions or along their lines. One of the most interesting things we discover do, examining the sacred furniture of Egypt is that the cherubim were, say, winged women, winged human beings. When they stretched their wings forward, the mercy seat, because of it, that's a, that alignment, that positioning of two cherubim facing each other with their wings stretched forward, in all likelihood, these were winged human beings that were being displayed on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. So they're not winged lions and they're not winged bulls. They're, they're, they're winged humans. And these are, this is a motif that we find a lot in late Bronze Age Egypt. Uh, for example, from the, uh, from the sacred bark of Amun-Re of uh, dating to Amenhotep III, there's this beautiful picture, and it's included in the book, of two winged goddesses with their wings stretched forward, and the image of the god is between them. Now, in the case of the Ark of the Covenant, there's no idol between the wings. This is very interesting. This is fascinating because it inverts the whole idea of God. And what I mean by that is that in ancient Egypt, when the, the, the typical uh, uh, ritual cycle was, you know, you get up in the morning, you go to the back of the temple, you clothe your God, you feed your God, you pick up your God, you take him to the sacred bark in the center and put him between the wings of the cherubim or the winged goddesses. Okay? He rules by day. Then at night, you take him from there, put him in the back of the temple, feed him, clothe him, put him to bed. Through that whole ritual process, the gods of ancient Egypt are being cared for by human hands. In the case of the Ark of the Covenant, there is no idol. There's no, there's no care for with human hands. Human hands don't interact with the with with Yahweh. And this has an incredible implication that was just mind blowing back then. Which is that God is not cared for by human hands. He never sleeps, and he's always on the throne. This is earth shattering for a late Bronze Age uh, um, person. This would have been inconceivable to them. But the Ark of the Covenant gives us a visual uh, symbol of that inversion that Yahweh is breaking the mold. And he's teaching the Israelites through this symbolism. I like that. Yeah. And, and, that's not the only secret. There's more secrets in the in the book, and and I guess what we can do is leave the rest there, and then mm -hmm. turn to some Q and A with the audience as we uh, seek to close out the show for today. But we'll first turn to some Q and A. So we've had uh, a couple come in. One from Trinity Radio, Braxton Hunter. He sent this uh, earlier on. He said, "It is a radio for speaking to God." That's a quote from Rene Belloc, famous archaeologist. What do you have any thoughts on that quote? 
I don't think it's a radio for speaking with God as much as God is meeting us in the middle. Uh it's it's I, I can I can see where he's driving at with this. I, I I can see where he's driving at with this. But it's also the place where the Shekinah glory rested. Okay? This is where the Shekinah glory came down from the top of Mount Sinai, inhabiting the tabernacle, and then dwelling between the wings. It's sort of that God followed the ark everywhere it went. Uh, Von Rod uh, basically said, where the ark is, there is God. So while that's a that's a localist sort of perception of it, and that's what he's sort of meaning here is this is this is this is how the Israelites would have perceived this in their time, that this is the local manifestation of God. Oh, someone's saying that so, Belloc is the villain in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, is he? Okay, I <laughs> didn't know that. <laughs> it's been a long time since either. I've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> oh, Braxton's just trolling us the whole time um is he okay he's taking advantage of my uh, the fact i don't watch a lot of movies <laughs> you do you do play guitar though you got that i do play guitar but i don't watch a lot of movies can't do it all <laughs> can't do it all all right uh yeah so as i mentioned we are going to be doing some q a with dr falk on this topic so if you have any questions for him leave them in the live chat if you'd like to send it in as a super chat, that's a way to guarantee that your question will be answered today. It, you don't have to. You don't have to send it as a super chat. But if you do, as I say, that'll sort of guarantee that you'll, your question will be asked today. Um, this was just a, a nice comment from Mr. Phil Fox. He says, big up to my brothers, Dr. Falk and Cameron. Keep up the good work, y'all. So Hi, nice Phil. comment. Thank you so much. Oh, you know Phil. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We're, we're friends. Oh, Awesome. Awesome. All right, so uh, here's from Inspiring Philosophy. He was in the live chat for a little while. He says, why is no one mentioning that my ancestor, Dr. Henry Walton Jones Jr., found the Ark of the Covenant <laughs> and saved it from the Germans? Wake up, sheeple. Still in a warehouse in Ohio. <laughs> Still in a warehouse, yeah. <laughs> All right, so here's uh, here's our last super chat, and then I'll, I'll check the live chat for... For comments. Uh, this one has to do with Catholicism. Catholics are sometimes criticized for having reliquaries containing historical objects and more, and I never thought the Ark was one. A very interesting argument for those who say it is something new. Do you have any thoughts on, on that and maybe the contemporary practice? Oh, yeah. Um, reliquaries are not uh, are not all new. They're, they're ancient. They're very, very ancient. And the Israelites aren't the only people who had them. You know, Egyptians had them also. And conceivably, even the Mesopotamians had them. So, so they're not new. Um, so I, I don't think, and and the fact is too that the Bible makes no point to criticize these furnishings that uh, say um, conceptualize manifestations of God. Okay, you know, even though we are told that you know, not to make a graven image or, and that, that Yahweh is an, an iconic God. We're never to, to portray him in the form of an idol. Okay. He's an, an iconic God. There is still materiality in ritual and the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of burnt offering, the incense altar, the the table of offerings, you know, these are uh, these are materiality that go into ritual. You know, there's 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 when we talk about rituals, there are several things involved. There's a pr process. All ritual has a process. It also has a material component. You know, when, for example, you, you do a baptism, you know, you speak the formula of baptism, but then you also use water to baptize, whether that's through immersion or sprinkling, it doesn't matter. You still have a materiality to that ritual. You know, when you have a marriage, you have a, a wedding, you know, there's, there is a kind of ritual, you know, the bride marches in procession down, down the aisle. 
you know, father gives away the bride, the priest consecrates the marriage, and then there's an exchange of rings. You know, there's materiality involved in that ritual. So every ritual has a material component. You know, whether we're using sacred chests, whether you're using uh, small trinkets or objects, you know, even people who do tattooing as a, a ritual, you know, they are basically, you know, putting ink on their skin as the materiality of that ritual. And I think one of the things is I think I think the whole importance of ritual is lost to many modern viewers. You know, we all do it. We all have ritual. We just don't always appreciate its importance to our culture and to our well-being. All right, let's move on to a another super chat that was just sent in from Jeffrey Anderson. I haven't even read it, so I don't know. Uh, what the content is. Do you suppose that the Philistines or Babylonians could have made any modifications to the Ark? Is there any historical precedent for this? Interesting question. Um, well, the Babylonians would sometimes take the idols of other cultures and, you know, bring them into their temples. You know, and I think this is what, say, the Philistines were doing when they, when they captured the Ark. They brought it into the Temple of Dagon to put beside Dagon. Okay, so I think that's what the Philistines were trying to do, but I don't think they made any modifications to it. It was pretty atypical for for these cultures to modify it. They would either destroy it outright for its precious metal content, or they would put it beside their other gods. Now, we do know that the Babylonians did keep items from the temple. Uh, there were several like ritual items like plates and uh, vessels and those sorts of things. You know, and this is where, say, Belshazzar gets into trouble where he starts drinking from the temple um, uh, vessels you know, in, his, in his, uh, his rather lavish party. So they would keep these, these items. They would put them in their storehouses. Uh, in case of portion items, they'd put them in their temples alongside their other gods. But they did generally didn't modify them. It's just something we don't see a lot of. All right, let's move on to a question from Examine Truth. Does David Falk see typological connections between the Ark and Mary in the New Testament? Oh, I understand so that. This. Yeah, we can skip this one if you'd like. Yeah, I think I think we should skip this one. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. All right, uh, next one is from QWERTY. Uh, Capturing Christianity, you mentioned that the Ark would have features of Egyptian sacred furniture. Do you think other objects like canoptic jars would also have been in line with gold, been lined with gold, maybe? Okay. <clears throat> uh, canoptic jars were generally not lined with gold. Uh, the reason why was because uh, it just wasn't really necessary. They were already proxy bodies. Now, when Egyptians used gold on, say, sacred furniture, um, it was, again, due to make a more lavish uh, thing. Now, they would put gold, say, on canopic shrines. That was done. And they would put gold foil on, say, mummies. But that had an important uh, uh, a ritual purpose, which was that the Egyptians believed that uh, gold was the flesh of the gods. And iron were, say, the bones of the gods. So when somebody died in Egypt, it was believed that they would travel to the underworld and they would go through this transformation where their flesh and bone would be transformed into the flesh and bone of the gods. It's a, it's a process called apotheosis. Now, they believed that they could accelerate this process through covering mummies with with gold foil or on say their coffins covering their coffins in gold so this is one of the reasons why gold was so coveted in in ancient egypt was it was part of it it was part of say the funerary process you needed it to ensure that you got to your destination in the afterlife without being you know nibbled at by demons who would 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 take chunks out of your flesh or spirit, as it were. 
So this was a very, very important consideration. Now, in the case of, say, canopic jars, they did not typically line them with gold. They were generally made out of calcite or stone, and that served as proxy bodies for the, for, for the organs, and they were protected by the shape of the, of the deities on the canopic jars, which were the four sons of Horus. So they had sufficient protection that they didn't need uh, to be lined with gold. All right, let's move on to a question from Culture Hunter. Capturing Christianity, did Israel get the idea of cherubims from Egyptian culture? Well, they're definitely in Egyptian culture. We do find them um, extant, uh, basically replete throughout uh, the, the history of, of Egypt. So when we talk about did Israel get the idea, it would have definitely been influenced. There's no, there's no doubt that Israel as a as a culture was influenced by Egyptian iconography and uh, religious culture. Like for example, we see on the uh, seal of Hezekiah, you know, his his seal, his seal on his signet ring, has basically a wajit, which is a solar Egyptian solar disc with wings holding two ox. You know, it doesn't get more Egyptian than that. So we do know that they are very, very influenced by Egyptian iconography, and the it, it seems very apparent that the that they're getting their notion, at least their early notions of the cherubim from the Egyptians. Now we also have to understand too that the symbol of the cherubim changes over time. Okay, at least within within Israelite culture. In the late Bronze Age, they're going to start with an Egyptian concession, conception of the cherubim. But when they get exiled to Babylon, they're going to pick up and, and have encounters with, the, say, the Assyrians. They're going to pick up a more Mesopotamian view of the cherubim, which has like the, the four to six wings and the four heads of, of various animals. So the idea of what a cherubim looks like is going to change over time. And it's going to, to respond to what is the dominant culture at the time? Okay, let's move on to a question from Matthew Craig. What do you think of some scholars who say Yahweh began his life as an idol? Uh, I think we have insufficient data here to say one way or the other. Um, I do, I do take the Kenite hypothesis, which basically says that that Moses brings the idea of Yahweh to the Israelites in Egypt while he is a shepherd in Midian. Okay. So I, I think that's where he, he first encounters Yahweh and that he's bringing Yahweh back to, to Israel at that time. We know that the Israelites, while they were in Egypt, before the Exodus, worshipped a variety of gods. They worshipped uh, Baal. That was probably the big, big, you know, cult uh, among the Israelites before the Exodus. You know, because there's a there's a temple of Seth or Baal at Avaris, a, uh, a substantial one. We also know that they worshipped gods such as Reshef and Astarte in in Egypt as well. So the Israelites are worshiping pagan gods while in Egypt. It's only when Moses comes back with this 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 god that nobody had heard of in Egypt that they go, "Who's this Yahweh guy?" And that's where sort of Yahweh worship begins for the Israelites. You know, prior to that, he's 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 El Shaddai, um, he's El Elyon, he's these other names of, of for God. But I don't we we don't know what Yahweh worship looked like in Midian or Edom for that matter. Um, there's some there is some even some possibility that that the Edomites were worshiping Yahweh as well. So we have just insufficient data here. So one question that was just asked in the live chat is from Brando. He says, what's the point of calling scripture the inspired word of God at this point? It's basically just mirroring everything pagan. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I do, actually. I think it's, it comes out of a misunderstanding of inspiration. It, it really comes out of a misunderstanding of inspiration. Inspiration is not that God creates everything de novo. 
That's not the inspiration of Scripture. The inspiration of Scripture is that God used people to communicate his word to mankind. You know, that God is, is taking, say, the prophets, you know, he's taking the prophets and he's, he's, he's guiding their lives. You know, every experience the prophet will have, whether it is the, it, it's, it's the schools he attends, whether it's the work he does, his, his disappointments, his successes, the literature he reads, you know, and it's at that point that that process of channeling the prophet to the point where he goes from pen to paper to parchment, that is, is the process of inspiration. Okay. It's at that point that he is ready, he is prepared to write the words that are God breathed. Okay. So God is again not doing this all de novo. He's this is this is a process in what we what in literature we call intertextuality. God is interacting with our culture. You know, it's it's like this. It's like this. You know, let's say you're writing a PhD dissertation, and you cite if you cite one reference, one citation for an entire say hundred thousand word PhD. That's plagiarism. Okay, if you cite no references at all that's fantasy because you're not having connected your dissertation to the real world your book is not not connected to the real world if you've got a thousand citations in your book that you're writing that's called masterful research because you firmly moored your uh your book the content of your book to reality at least the reality that that that's 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 uh, recognized by your culture. The Israelites are growing up in a they 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 are they are living in a pagan world. They are living in a pagan world. This is mooring God's message to reality. At least the reality that they understood in their particular time. This doesn't make it less God breathed. This makes it more God breathed. Because it is, it is it is firmly, firmly rooted in their culture, in time and space. It's not just a copying wholesale off of paganism. It's interacting with it. It's saying, hey, this practice is right, these ones are wrong. Don't worship idols. Okay? Yeah, I mean, you're not you're not gonna find that in the pagan world, I'll tell you that. Where God says, "Don't make an idol," <laughs> that's not that's not something you're going to find in, in in paganism. I'll tell you that. But they will they will interact with say uh, like works like Enuma Elish, the taught Memphite theology. You know they are they are interacting. The authors of the Bible are interacting with this very these various works because that's the culture they understood. Yeah, even William Lane Craig will talk about the fact that inspiration is really about the end result as opposed to like yeah. what's all made up. So I think your point about like it's inspiration is not just the idea that everything is created de novo. Like that's, I think yeah. a good point. All right. That's uh, not, that's not inspiration. Yeah, yeah. It's just, that's just a simply not inspiration. And I think, I think we've done a very, very poor job of teaching what inspiration is. We've done a very poor job of this. And I and I think we could go do a lot better to to teach this in 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 a way that's more relevant and easier to understand. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, another super chat from Jeffrey Anderson. He says, "What do you think of the theory that Baal received the title of Rider on the Clouds from the Philistines, being in possession of the Ark for seven months?" Uh, the Baal receiving the title of of a rider on the clouds long predates the Philistines, uh, at least the Philistine possession of the Ark. Uh, we find this in, in the text at Ugarit. Okay, so so this is this is this is not this this long predates that. Long predates it by hundreds of years. Right. Okay, let's move on uh, to another question. This one's from Christopher Flux. Question: Do you think that the temple will be rebuilt? If so, will a new Ark be constructed? 
Uh, do I think the temple will be rebuilt? Yes, I do think the temple will be rebuilt. Uh, I don't think the Ark will be reconstructed. The whole purpose of the Ark was to move the Shekinah glory from Mount Sinai to uh, the Holy of Holies inside the temple. Okay, so that's sort of the, if we look at it as, as say, the long-term story of the Ark, that's sort of where it, it is. And it had a minor function in the ritual too uh, at Yom Kippur when the blood at Yom Kippur was sprinkled on the mercy seat as well. So it had that function as well. But that function wasn't necessary. You didn't need that function for the temple to be uh, bona fide or legitimate. Um, <clears throat> if, we, if the temple is rebuilt for a third time, it'll probably follow the same sort of rituals that were done during the second rebuilding of the temple. Um, say, the, uh, during the second temple period, where there was no ark inside of that temple either. So uh, from the time of, say, the Persian rebuilding of the temple right through to, say, its destruction in 70 AD, there was, never, there was no ark inside that temple, inside the Holy of Holies. It was just an empty space. You know, there's even an um, anecdote where, say, uh, Pompey, you know, comes, walks through Jerusalem and he walks into, say, the uh, Holy Holies and finds nothing there. You know, so, uh, so you know, there's, there's no necessity for the Ark to be rebuilt. You know, there is necessity for other things to be rebuilt uh, for, the, for, the, for a temple. You know, they will need to rebuild an uh, a altar of burnt offering. That will need to be rebuilt. They'll need an incense altar. That will need to be rebuilt. They'll need the, the, a table for the showbread. That'll need to be rebuilt. But the Ark of the Covenant is the only item of the four pieces of tabernacle furniture that will not need to be rebuilt because it's not necessary, because it served its purpose. Its purpose is complete. So I've actually been to Israel, and I think that they, so, I mean, someone has plans to rebuild the Ark. There, we, there was a, maybe it was a museum or some like, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember touring a uh, a little shop near the Temple Mount that had artifacts from the Ark and or, or not artifacts. Yeah, this is probably like the, a, It sounds like this is the Temple Institute you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got they've got a um, a a front uh, storefront, uh, very very close to the Temple Mount. And they've rebuilt like the candelabra and um, various items like the um, the ephod for the uh, high priest, and they're really hoping they're really hoping to uh, rebuild the temple, and they want to make sure that they're ready. You know, and then the Temple Institute every so often will put out press releases. They go, "Oh, it's a miracle! The red heifer has has finally been re uh, rebred," and, and they go through this every like. 10, 20 years, you know, so, you know, I, I take what the Temple Institute says with a little bit of a grain of salt at this point, because they've been doing this for like 30 years now. So, um, <clears throat> but there's no necessity for the art to be rebuilt, reconstructed. It's, it's just not, uh, it's not important to, to the temple rituals. It can do without it. In fact, we hear very, very little once uh, David, or sorry, Solomon brings the Ark of the Covenant back into the temple and the Shekinah glory fills the Holy of Holies, we really don't hear much about the Ark again. The last time we hear about it is when um, King Josiah commands the temple to be um, refurbished so that the Ark of the Covenant can return into it because the, the temple at that point had become structurally unsound. So on, on the same topic, I, I, I have a not a huge interest, but a small interest in this topic. And I mean, it, the, the name of the, the monument is, is slipping my mind. But on, on top of the temple Mount, you have, well, oh, I can't remember it. There's two, there's two Islamic structures that are up there. And so is yeah. your view that like the temple Mount, those are going to have to be destroyed in order to, to build the new temple? Or do you think that there's going to like, they're going to find another spot for it alongside the yeah. other two? Well, you got two the mosques the up rock. there on the Temple Mount. Yeah. You got the Dome of the Rock and then you have the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Okay. And now you've got an underground one as well. So, you know, they've got three mosques up there. <clears throat> but um, I don't think you would need to, to tear it down. Now, 
I don't think the uh, Dome of the Rock is on the original site of the Ark, uh, of, of the Temple Mount. Okay. Now, the reason my, my justification for this is that uh, we are told that the, the slab of rock that the Ark of the Covenant was placed on was three fingers high. That slab on the Dome of the Rock is three feet high. Okay, so it's 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 a little too big. Also, it's 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 got a very strange configuration to it, which is I think it's a hexagon. It's either a hexagon or an octagon. I can't remember. But we do know that these are the say in, in after after the temple was destroyed in seventy A.D. It was replaced by a Roman um, temple to Jupiter. Okay. And then that was turned into a church. Now, the way Roman uh, uh, temples uh, are often constructed is you'll have a, the main section of the temple is a long square building. But in sort of the, the uh, foyer leading into the temple will be a hexagon or a octagon shaped pavilion that leads into the temple. So I, my thought here is that, that, that the Dome of the Rock is actually built on the foundation of that pavilion, that foyer for the uh, Temple of Jupiter. And the real sort of uh, temple is w basically a small, there's a small little dome uh, on the outskirts called the Dome of the Tablets. I think that's where the original Ark was, was uh, or sorry, the original temple was situated, and that's where the Holy of Holies would have been. And it aligns better with, say, the Eastern Gate, too. So I think that's 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 where I think. So they wouldn't have to they wouldn't have to tear down any any existing uh, Islamic structure other than that that tiny little uh, dome of the tablets. That's that would be the only thing that would have to go. And that thing is is but but eight feet tall. I mean, it's not even. I mean, it's really tiny. And so there's plenty of room up there for them to rebuild, should they ever want to. Mm -hmm. It's just politically a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we uh, we did just get a super chat, and so let me go ahead and pull that one on the screen. Here we go. All right, this one from Angel WVM. How did ancient people feed their idols? What was the process considering idols can't exactly eat? Ah, this is interesting. Basically, what they would do is they would give... Uh, Bread and uh, food offerings, or loaf, loaf. I should say loaf, and and uh, loaf and uh, drink offerings. Now the way it works is that they would, at least in Egypt, this is how it worked. They would bake these, and and, and really low heat bake. Well, okay, I shouldn't point that out. These loaves of barley, and they would present them in front of the idol. Okay, so that would give that would be the presenta presentation of food. And then they had these offering tables, libation offering tables that had a their square table with a gutter around the edge leading to a spout. They would pour, say, wine on the offering table, which would then, say, be channeled off into the spout, which would end up going into another jug. So that would be their libation offering. They would then take the food that was given to the idol, the bread, the loaves, the wine, and then they would give it to the priests. And then the priests would either eat it or turn it into beer or redistribute it, you know, to, to meet their necessities. So food wasn't wasted in, say, ancient Egypt. This is not like uh, the Egyptians didn't do um, feed their idols the same way as, say, for example, Israelite offerings were done where they were burnt and even not all the Israelite offerings were burnt. Some of them were also used to feed the priests, etc. So that's what happened here is that in the case of feeding the idols, they would just present it in front of the idol. The idol would be presumed to eat it, but the food was still good and then was basically distributed to, to pay for the workers at the temple. All right, let's do one more question. And this one's from Examine examine truth he was the one who uh, originally asked the question about typology uh, this one looks still somewhat related but uh it's i think going to be more straightforward type of answer could common people touch the ark was there a special person who would handle it and its contents 
Yes. Uh, there were the common people were not permitted to touch the Ark. Only uh, Levites were permitted to handle the Ark. Okay. Now, it was general practice not to touch the Ark. Okay. Because it was sacred. It was holy. It was holy space. Mm -hmm. The space between the wings was holy space, so you couldn't touch that. That was that was not permitted. But it also probably would have been that it was also cared for as well uh, by various means and processes, like um, like if you were you you if you were uh, say the son uh, of Aaron, you could be a priest in the temple. Okay. And that would allow you to say, you know, if, if you're a high priest, sprinkle the, the blood on the Ark at Yom Kippur. Uh, it also would have... Um, we also see, too, though, that, uh, for example, when the Ark was, say, um, captured by the Philistines, they, they pop the top open, and they find nothing inside. It's empty. Where do the where are the two tablets of the Ten Commandments go? Somebody had to remove the Ten Commandments at one point. Presumably, they were removed when when the when the Ark was brought into the temple. But somebody would have had to lift that lid off and retrieve the Ten Commandments. So we do know that uh, that at some point those those tablets were removed for some reason. Now you could you were not allowed to carry you didn't have to be a priest to transport the ark of the covenant but you had to be a kohathite which was a uh, one of the clans of levi so each clan of the three clans of uh that descended directly from uh levi had a special function within say the 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 rituals of the tabernacle you know some were assigned to build the temple and take it down. Some were assigned to carry it, and some were assigned to act as priests within it. So each, each of the clans of the Levites had their particular role within those uh, rituals. Now, once the temple is established, those, some of those clans no longer had a, had a purpose, had, had a function. So they, they ended up doing, more, say, more pastoral ministries in the uh, in the various tribal land holdings, like for example, there was no no need to assemble or disassemble the tabernacle anymore after the temple. So those Levites went on to other duties. But overall, you ha if you wanted to handle the holy objects, you had to have a certain pedigree for it to be lawful. All right, I, I think that's going to do it for us today. Um, I, I did want to mention one last time. And I think I'm actually going to take your advice and put this on the coffee table instead of like keeping it in a <laughs> library behind me. I think I am going to put it on the coffee table. That's, that's a really good idea. And uh, it is like, a, a, let me put myself full screen here. It's a little bit bigger than like a, a standard size book, I think. And so it would con like it would, you could actually use this as like a book that you put on your coffee table. But there are tons of, uh, like I said, images and figures and stuff. Like every single page, even like my little kids could uh, could thumb through it and find some really cool things. So I think I'm going to take your advice and actually put, put it on uh, the coffee table. But I, I want to just remind people that if they're interested in picking this up, the Ark of the Covenant, in its Egyptian context, I've got it linked in the description of this video for your convenience. You can just click the link and then buy it on Amazon. And... Uh, yeah, great book, great interview. Is there anything that you'd like to leave with the audience before we close it out? Um, not really. We're having a... Uh, do come and subscribe to my channel, Ancient Egypt and the Bible, where we do educational videos every week. We do a variety of shorts. We have a live stream every Friday where we take your questions on the various aspects of Ancient Egypt as it relates to the Bible. Uh, we're also having a premiere tonight where we air a uh, debate that has been uh, taken offline. And uh, we hope to see you here at uh, 8, 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific time tonight. Remind me the name of your of your show. Oh, the, of my, your channel, my, sorry. Ancient Egypt and the Bible. 
So people, let me actually uh, say this too. I'll, I'll put that in a, in a pinned comment. So that way people can just go look there, click the link and then go directly over there. But yes, subscribe. And if you have more questions, like if we weren't able to get to your question today in the show, then just go directly to the source. Go subscribe to him. He's active on YouTube and he does these Q and A's, as he said, every Friday. So that's how you can get in touch with him and learn more about his work and, and uh, ask him questions directly. But Dave, it's been great to have you here. Uh, it's a fun topic. I, the the part that uh, was really interesting to me is the whole Temple Mount and the, the the new temple stuff. Like that was, I mean, obviously the stuff about the the Ark is is super interesting too. But I wasn't expecting to to get into all that. So thanks for coming on. Uh, this was great, and I'll see you guys. Uh, oh yeah, don't forget uh, if you're interested in picking up this mug that I've been, mug <laughs> mug this mug that I've been drinking out of today. We're doing a giveaway tomorrow with it. So just stay tuned to the channel and we'll see you guys in the next video. So see you soon. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work. People like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?